Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look, that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him? For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet, ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried, but we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God, and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies the punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering if he offers his life in atonement he shall see his heirs. He shall have a long life. And through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish is over. He shall see the light and be content. By his suffering shall my servant justify many, taking their thoughts on himself. Hence, I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner while he was bearing the thoughts of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response to the psalm. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your, your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. 
Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice set me free. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem me, Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In the face of all my foes I am a reproach an object of scorn to my neighbors and of fear to my friends. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like a dead man forgotten in men's hearts, like a thing thrown away. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My life is in your hands, deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine on your servant, save me in your love. Be strong, let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sinning. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard for his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ was humbler yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high, and gave him the name which is above all names. Hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there 
with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You're also one of this man's disciples, aren't you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this of your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? 
Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Anyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do, Do not, not write, write the king of the Jews, Jews but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let, Let us, us not tear it, but, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. 
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the passion of the Lord. Please sit down. Today is not like other days, not at all. And we might well prefer not to be here. And that's not just us, because it was at the cross that the disciples' faith was destroyed. What we see is a real human death. But it's worse than that. As Christians, we've got used to the cross. We look at it every week. We sing about it. We might wear a cross sometimes. 
But for the early Christians, this was an unbelievable scandal. For here was the worst torture, humiliation and death that they knew about. The pain was excruciating. There's a word that comes from crooks, the cross, excruciating. Yet St. Paul could not be clearer. We don't just proclaim Jesus, the prophet and the teacher. We proclaim Christ crucified. So we have to watch. We see Jesus thirsty on the cross. He bows his head and he dies. And at the point of death, we hear from the cross an entirely human cry such as we might make, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's the first line of a psalm, Psalm 22, a psalm all about the suffering of the just man rejected by God. And the words, I thirst, are from Psalm 69. And the final words recorded by Luke, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, are from Psalm 31. These are words written down already. And now on the cross, the words become flesh again. The scriptures live in human form. Jesus dies praying. Nobody cares. So the soldiers say, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. See how mockery and contempt meet religious practice. You'll find they often do. So Jesus died at prayer and the cross becomes the great prayer of our faith. We join the prayer of Jesus on the cross. And today, one thing becomes a little clearer. The death of Christ summed up his life. What was his life? His life was love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. In everything he did. But what is love? Something is only love and it can only give life when it is freely given. We learn that from our own lives. Jesus saw our lovelessness, our inability to give our lives away, our loneliness, and his arms are stretched out now in an embrace. When we say or sing, more likely that we're saved by the cross. That doesn't mean we've joined an exclusive club of those who are going to do better in the long run. It means that the world is saved, that is, confirmed as good and holy by God who is love. Catherine of Siena wrote, Nails were not enough to hold God and man nailed and fastened to the cross had not love held him there. But there's more. This is about you and me. On the cross, the pain of the world, the injustice of all that random undeserved suffering which we see around us, that is held by the crucified man. It is nailed there. It is not projected elsewhere. As it says in the letter to the Colossians, in Christ, all things hold together. The wounds of the crucified one are not a price that was paid so that God would love us again a settlement of old scores. 
What a terrible God that would be. A God thirsty for blood. You see, I don't think God has good and, ma good and bad moods as we do. God doesn't bear grudges. Surely God so loved the world. And God respects our freedom. We alone bear responsibility for the choices we make. And the wounds of Christ we are shown are there on his body to show us the cost of our discipleship. They are what we do and continue to do to others. Forgiveness is not cheap. It cost God the death of his son. And forgiveness comes with God's judgment on sin, on the way we are, our flawed humanity. And our resurrection life will always be marked by the signs of the cross, and so will the world. The misery and suffering we see in today's world are Christ's wounds. The darkness of this day is the darkness of the human heart. Our God is a wounded God. And the cross proves everything because the cross clarifies what God does. St. Paul told the Corinthians, the cross is the power of God and the wisdom of God. God doesn't just tolerate human suffering. He sees we can't help ourselves. So he enters the suffering as well as the joy he becomes part of it. The crucifix is our image of God. It's our image, but not a symbol, an actual event, a crucified Christ. But it's still an absolutely terrifying sight, the worst imaginable torture and humiliation. Why was it so terrible? Because I think, in order to show to us God's identification with the human condition to be one like us, once and for all, Jesus had to lose all sense of personal union with God to be godless, God-forsaken, abandoned. What is not undergone is not overcome. That's why Good Friday is so frightening. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's what we say too. Did I mention forgiveness? I've often wondered what it meant to say that Jesus died for our sins. It seems such a strange transaction. What I think it means is that transactions, rewards for being good, punishments for being bad, all that is now over, passed away, replaced by a new covenant, a new agreement, a new deal between God and the human race. Jesus undid that old system of reward and punishment once and for all, as the epistle to the Hebrews says. So now we say, Jesus is the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. It's a metaphor, of course. It's a way of saying that Jesus takes away sin, what goes wrong with us, by entering and transforming it into a new life, a forgiven life. Jesus purifies life. He takes in hatred, transforms it, and gives back love. He takes in chaos, transforms it, gives back peace. 
He takes in jealousy and fear and offers back total acceptance. This is the economy of grace. Here is the new possibility for the transformation of our hearts and minds into line with that of the crucified Son of God. Here is our salvation. Here is eternal life on offer to each of us. So instead of running from the cross in fear and panic, which we want to do, we learn, and it takes a lifetime, to approach the crucified one with trust and hope and love. We come to the foot of the cross to praise God for his help when we could not help ourselves. Lord Jesus Christ, help of the helpless, O oh, abide with me. Amen.
my people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I am your creator, Lord of the universe. I have entrusted this world to you, but you have created the means to destroy it. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done to you? Listen to me. I made you in my image, but you have degraded body and spirit and marred the image of your God. You have deserted me and turned your backs on me. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I filled the earth with all that you need so that you might serve and care for one another as I have cared for you, but you have cared only to serve your own wealth and power. Holy God, holy, holy and strong, strong holy, holy and, and immortal, have, have mercy upon us. us. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I made my children of one blood to live in families rejoicing in one another. But you have embittered the races and divided the nations. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I commanded you to love your neighbour as yourself, to love and forgive even your enemies. But you have made vengeance your rule and hate your God. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. In the fullness of time I sent you my Son, that in him you might know me, and through him find life and peace, but you put him to death on the cross. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. Through the living Christ, I called you into my church to be servants to the world, but you have grasped at privilege and forgotten my will. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I have given you a heavenly gift and a share in the Holy Spirit. I have given you the spiritual energies of the age to come, but you have turned away and crucified the Son of God afresh. My people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done for you? Listen to me. I have consecrated you in the truth. I have made you to be one in the unity of the Father and the Son by the power of the Spirit. But you have divided my church and shrouded my truth. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Turn again, my people, listen to me. Let your bearing to one another arise out of your life in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and in obedience accepted the death of the cross. But I have bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Turn again, my people, listen to me.
Be sit or kneel for the prayers. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Therefore we pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, for bishops and other ministers and those whom they serve, for Paul, our bishop, and the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this place, for those to be baptized, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, us. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders, for Charles our King and the parliaments of this land, for those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious us. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on justice may be established throughout the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his word. For greater understanding between Christian and Jew, for the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. Lord, hear us. Lord, God of Abraham, bless the children of your covenant, both Jew and Christian. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart, and hasten the coming of your kingdom, when the Gentiles shall be gathered in, all Israel shall be saved, and we shall dwell together in mutual love and peace under the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe the gospel of Christ, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost faith, for the contemptuous and scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him, for all who deny the faith of Christ crucified, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Lord, hear us. Merciful God, creator of all the people of the earth, have compassion on all who do not know you, and by the preaching of your gospel with grace and power, gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Let us pray for all those who suffer, for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and those who watch beside them, that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad, the strength of those who suffer. Hear the prayers of your children who cry out of any trouble, and to every distressed soul grant mercy, relief, and refreshment. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commend ourselves and all God's children to his unfailing love, and pray for the grace of a holy life, that, with all who have died in the peace of Christ, we may come to the fullness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. Lord, hear us. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favourably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation, and let the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen behold the lamb of god behold him who takes away the sins of the world blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Corpus Christi. The body of Christ. The 
blessing of Christ. The body of Christ. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set your passion, cross and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Grant mercy and grace to the living, rest to the departed, to your church peace and concord, and to us sinners forgiveness, and everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you are alive and reign God, now and forever. Amen.
May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.